All right, let's do <clears throat> 4.5. I, I mentioned in 4.4 that we would talk about how to uh, approximate zeros of functions, uh, zeros of polynomials, when we don't know how to find the zeros directly, right? So if we can't get the exact values, we can at least get a pretty good approximation for what the values are. And that's true, so we are going to talk about that in this section, uh, towards the end of the section. Um, but what I want to do first is talk about graphs of polynomial functions. Um, graphing polynomial functions really amounts to being able to find zeros of polynomial functions. If you can find the zeros, then you're pretty much ready to graph. Um, there are just a couple of details that we need to talk about. So one of the details is we need to talk about the end behavior of a function. So the end behavior of a function is uh, what happens to the function as x gets really large in the positive direction or really large in the negative direction. Um, we've seen examples of functions that sort of level off and approach a limit as x goes gets really big or really large. And we've seen other examples where uh, the function maybe goes off to infinity or negative infinity, uh, infinity or negative infinity or something like that. So um, what I want to do is show that let's look at a couple examples to see what to see if we can figure out what the end behavior of a polynomial should be. So let's look for example at 2x cubed plus 5x squared minus 7x plus 11. And I'm, I'm asking us to show that p of x is approximately 2x cubed. So approximately is just its first term when x is really large. So let's do that. So here's how we can do that. What we can do is factor out a, an x cubed, which may seem kind of strange because you're like, wait, not all of the terms have an x cubed, especially the last one. But here's how it works, right? If you factor out an x cubed, remember, you just divide each of these terms by whatever you're factoring out. So if I divide the first term by x cubed, I get 2. If I divide the second term by x cubed, I'm going to get x squared divided by x cubed is, so I'm going to get 5 over x, right? If I take out an x cubed from the third term, it's going to be a 7 over x squared, and the last term is going to be 11 over x cubed. You can foil, or you can um, distribute the x cubed back in to verify that this is true, right? That you're going to get 2x cubed, 5x squared, negative 7x, and 11. Now, how does this help us? Well, if you imagine x getting really, really big. If you're looking at this term, as x gets really, really big, this number is going to get really, really small, right? Like 11 over 1,000 is a pretty small number. 11 over 10,000 is even smaller. 11 over 10 million is even smaller than that. And as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this thing is going to get closer and closer to 0. So it's going to go to 0. I'm just going to put a little arrow through it and say it's going to go to 0. And if you think about it, the same thing's going to happen here. And the same thing's going to happen there. But see, 2, that doesn't happen with 2. 2, as x gets really large, 2 just remains 2. Okay? And so if we were to distribute that x cubed back in, then we would see that p of x is approximately just 2x cubed um, as x goes to plus or minus infinity. So as x gets really large, p of x goes to 2x cubed. It's, um, it, it, it's a little bit hand wavy, this explanation, I guess, but it should make some sense. It's like, as x gets really large, right, x cubed is going to be so much bigger than x squared, or x, or even 11, right? It's going to be way bigger than 11. So it's like these other terms almost don't even matter anymore. If x is really big, the only term that really matters at that point is just the first term. We can see the same thing in example 2, right? So if f of x is negative x to the 10th plus 5x to the 6th minus 13x to the 5th and so forth, if we're trying to figure out what happens in the long run, in other words, what happens as x gets really large, the rest of these terms aren't even going to matter because x to the 10th is going to just dominate so much that this function is basically just going to look like x to the 10th in, in the long run. And to see that, we could do the same thing that we did before. We can factor out an x to the 10th. We'd be left with negative 1 plus 5 over x to the 4th uh, minus... 13 over x to the 5th 
plus 2 over x to the 8th plus 3 over x to the 9th. And all of these terms are going to go to 0. right? They're all going to go to 0 as x gets really, really big, except for the first one. Right, so this is going to be approximately negative x to the 10th as x goes to plus or minus infinity. So in general, right, in general, if f of x is a n x to the n plus a n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 and so forth, then f of x is going to be approximately just its first term, a n x to the n, as x gets really big uh, in the positive or negative direction. In other words, the end behavior of f of x is the same as the end behavior of a n x to the n. So in order to describe the end behavior of a polynomial, all we have to be able to do is describe the end behavior of its first term. Like the rest of the terms aren't really even going to matter that much when you're talking about the end behavior. They matter a lot when you're talking about like what's happening close to zero. Okay? But the further away you get from zero, the less and less these terms even matter at all. Okay? So, um, so we have four cases to consider them. We have the case to consider it when n is even and a is a positive number, a n is a positive number. We have the case to consider when n is even and a is a negative number. And then we have the case, the same cases when n is odd, right? n odd coefficient um, um, positive and then n odd uh, coefficient negative, right? So n even coefficient positive, n even coefficient negative, n odd coefficient positive, n odd coefficient negative. Those are the four cases to consider. Um, so here's what happens in each of these four cases. If n is even and your coefficient is positive, then the function is going to behave like a quadratic. It's going to behave like a quadratic, right? So there might be some stuff that happens in the middle, right? But the end behavior is going to do this. Okay? Um, so in other words, f of x is going to go to infinity as x goes to, sorry, f of x is going to go to infinity as x goes to negative infinity, right? As x goes to negative infinity, f of x is going off to positive infinity. As x goes to positive infinity, f of x is still going off to positive infinity, right? So that's the end behavior when n is even and the coefficient is positive. When n is even and the coefficient is negative, again, it's going to behave like a quadratic, but um, uh, but it's going to be tipped over because the coefficient is a negative number, right? So it's going to tip down like this. And again, like, there could be stuff going on in the middle. It doesn't matter, right? And at the end of the day, the end behavior is going to be just like a quadratic, okay? So this would say that as x goes to negative infinity, f of x is going to negative infinity. And as x goes to positive infinity, f of x is going to negative infinity still. When n is odd and a is positive, then you're going to get behavior that's like a cubic equation. right? Cubics fall to the left and rise to the right. And there could be stuff happening in between. right? doesn't really matter. Um, the n behavior is going to look like a cubic. It's going to look like this. So as x approaches negative infinity, f of x approaches negative infinity. As x approaches positive infinity, f of x approaches positive infinity. These things should make sense, by the way, right? Because if n is even, like if n is, you know, 2 or 4 or 6, when you raise a negative number to an even exponent, you get a positive number back out. So even if you're plugging in a negative, you're going to get a positive number back out. If you're plugging in a positive, obviously you're going to get a positive number back out. The only way that could change is if the coefficient is negative, in which case you're going to get negatives and negatives. Whereas when you're dealing with an odd exponent, right, negative numbers will yield negative inputs. Or negative, negative inputs will yield negative outputs. And positive inputs will yield positive outputs. Unless your coefficient is negative, in which case it's switched, right? And it's going to look something like that with some stuff going on in between. Okay? So this is what the end behavior is like for these functions. Uh, and again, the, the end behavior of a polynomial really boils down to the end behavior of its first term. 
right? The rest of the terms don't even matter. It's just the first term. The first term determines the end behavior of the function. Um, let me give you a couple examples. So number three says, determine the end behavior of the following functions. So for f of x, we've got negative 2x to the fourth plus 5x squared plus 3. If we're concerned about the end behavior, um, you can give this answer in a couple different ways. You can either just draw a picture or you can write down like the limit kind of uh, ideas that we were talking about on the previous page. So the picture would look like this. Our exponent is even, but the coefficient is negative. So it's going to look like a parabola going down. That's what the end behavior is going to be like. Okay, In between, some stuff could happen, right? But the end behavior is going to look like this. So in symbols, we would say uh, f of x goes to negative infinity as x goes to negative infinity. And f of x goes to negative infinity as x goes to positive infinity. Right? That's the end behavior. For part g, we have an odd exponent and a positive coefficient. That means it's going to behave like a cubic function, something like that. Right? So there, there's the end behavior. Uh, f of x, f of x is going to negative infinity as x goes to negative infinity. And f of x is going to positive infinity as x goes to positive infinity. Okay, and we can take a look at these things in Desmos to kind of convince us that this is true. Let me open up Desmos here. So uh, in Desmos, if I put in negative 2x to the fourth uh, plus 5x squared plus 3, okay, you can see that there's some stuff going on in the middle. But in the end, right, as you zoom out, in the end, it just looks like negative 2x to the fourth. In fact, I'm going to graph negative 2x to the fourth over the top of this. So you can see that um, in the end, right, down here, the, there's, the blue and the red are practically indistinguishable. So up here close to zero, sure, there's, there's some stuff going on, right, that's different. But the further out you go, the more similar the graphs become, okay? And so that's kind of the idea of end behavior. It's important to know the end behavior so that you know how to graph the function, right? So that you know what the function kind of, the general shape of the function is. <clears throat> okay, so there's that. Now the next thing that we need to talk about is multiplicity. We've talked about multiplicity already, but um, multiplicity shows up in the graph of the function in kind of an interesting way. So let's review the concept of multiplicity. Um, if you have a function that you can factor like x minus c to the m power uh, times some other polynomial, um, then the original function f of x uh, has c as a 0, but, but it's a 0 of multiplicity m, right? It was a 0 m times. <clears throat> so just as a kind of review of that concept, Let's, let's find the zeros of this polynomial and state their multiplicities. You'll notice that this is already completely factored. Well, it's completely factored over the reals, right? This could be factored down into, uh, into um, uh, x plus i, x minus i, right? So we go down to linear terms. So I guess we should do that. Okay. But then once it's been completely factored down to linear terms, you can set you can tell what the zeros are, right? The zeros here are gonna be negative one, multiplicity two, negative i, positive i, three, and four, multiplicity three. Okay. Notice in particular that here we had an x squared plus 1, but that doesn't mean that we had a 0 of negative 1 multiplicity 2. This factor here 
is a negative 1 multiplicity 2, right? Careful with where the exponent is. It's a 0, negative 1, and it happens twice. It's a negative 1 multiplicity 2. This is not a 0 of negative 1 at all. This is a 0 of i or a negative i, right? Okay, so just be careful of that. But, but these are the zeros and their corresponding multiplicities, okay? Um, so how does this show up in the graph? Well, uh, let's say that c is a zero of multiplicity m. c is a real number of multiplicity m. If m is odd, then the graph of f crosses the x-axis at c. If m is even, then the graph touches but does not cross the x-axis at c. So it just comes up and kisses the x-axis at c, but it doesn't cross through. If c is not a real number, then it doesn't even make an appearance in the real Cartesian plane. So that's something to keep in mind, right? Like when you're going to graph these things, you're not going to graph the non-real zeros because when we're dealing with a graph, we're dealing with the real outputs only, right? Real inputs, real outputs. So we're not dealing with the non-real zeros. So number five says, determine where f of x crosses and where it touches but does not cross the x-axis. So remember, it's going to cross through the x-axis whenever you have a real zero with odd multiplicity. Um, this is the same polynomial as what we did in example four. So we already know our real zeros are the, this one, this one, and this one. So there are three real zeros. These other two zeros don't count because they're non-real. Okay. Now of these three real zeros, which ones have odd multiplicities? Three and four. Right, three and four both have odd multiplicities. So the graph is going to cross the x-axis at three and four. At negative one, it's going to touch the x-axis, but it's not going to cross the x-axis there. It's just going to touch it. Okay. So it crosses at three and four, and it touches, but does not cross at negative one because, whoops, so it crosses at 3 and 4, but it touches, but it only touches at negative 1. It doesn't cross there. Okay? Um, all right. So believe it or not, those are the only two missing pieces of information that we needed in order to be able to graph polynomial functions. Um, but, well, maybe one more additional piece is that graphs of polynomial Polynomial functions are always smooth curves. They don't have any holes. They don't have any asymptotes. They don't have any sharp cusps or anything like that. Okay? The proof of this fact requires calculus, so I'm going to leave it to your calculus instructor to prove this to you. Um, but for now, just take it for granted that polynomials are just smooth curves. So here are the steps that I typically take to graph a polynomial function. The first thing I do is I find the real zeros. The real zeros are the x-intercepts of the graph. Then I use the multiplicities of the zeros to determine where the graph crosses and where it only touches the x-axis. And then I determine the end behavior of the graph. Okay. As an optional thing, you can plug in test points between each of the zeros, each of the x-intercepts, to check your work. But that's not totally necessary. Okay. In fact, I usually don't do that. But, um, but you can do it if you'd like. I'll probably give you an example where I do that so that you know how it works. Um, but let's graph some of these things. Okay. So looking at this function here, I know that my zeros are, well, zero, right? Zero itself is a zero. It's a zero of multiplicity two. I know that three is a zero. And I know that negative 5 is a 0 of multiplicity 3. Okay? So those are my x-intercepts. 0, negative 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 3. 1, 2, 3. Okay, those are my zeros. Now, um, the graph is going to just touch this but not cross through the x-intercept there, or the x-axis there. Um, 
but it is going to cross through here and it's going to cross through here as well. Okay, so that's important to know. Um, and then another thing that I need to know is the end behavior. Now getting the end behavior of this graph is not going to be as easy as it would be for others because this has been factored out. And so we have to try to figure out what the first term would look like. Okay, Remember, the end behavior of the polynomial is going to be the same as, as the end behavior of the first term. So I'm not going to completely multiply this out, but if I imagined multiplying this out, first I would have to cube this binomial. Uh, which means I multiply it out three times, right? If I did that, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna end up with an x cubed, right? Then when I multiply that by x minus three, I'm gonna get an x to the fourth, and then when I multiply that x to the fourth times x squared, I'm gonna get an x to the sixth, right? So as x approaches infinity, f of x is approximately x to the sixth power. And notice that my coefficients are all 1, so my leading coefficient is in fact going to be 1, right? So as x goes to infinity, f of x is approximately x, x to the 6th power. So I have an even, I have an even, uh, sorry, I have an even exponent, and I have a positive coefficient. So the end behavior has got to be something like this. So that tells me that after I break through this, uh, this uh, x-intercept, it's going to continue climbing, and same thing over here. When I break through that x-intercept, the graph is going to continue climbing. Now in between, I've got to come up and I've got to touch, I've got to touch this intercept without crossing through, right? So I've got to come up and touch that, and then come back down. So the graph of my function should look something like this. Now exactly how far down does this curve go? Well, we don't really know. Um, that's something that you'll learn how to figure out in calculus. It requires taking derivatives and doing some conceptual things that um, I don't want to get into in a pre-calculus class. Okay? But you'll, you'll figure out in calculus exactly how far down this dips before it starts to come back up. For now, this is the best picture that we're going to get. Okay? You're welcome to plug in a test point. Like You could plug in negative 3, and if you plug in negative 3, you'll get some sense for how far down this is going. Um, but you're not really going to know what its absolute minimum is without using some calculus, okay? Um, so this is a good enough picture for us, right? This is perfectly acceptable, okay? So this would, this would be a good picture. And that's that, right? That's how you graph a polynomial function. Okay, let's do another one. So here's another one. Again, it's already been nicely factored for us, so we can read off the zeros pretty easily. So I have a zero of 2, multiplicity 3. I have a zero of negative 10 thirds, right? We would subtract the 10 and then divide by 3, so we'd get negative 10 thirds. Multiplicity 2. And then we have zeros of uh, i and negative i. Now those zeros are not real, so they're not even going to they're not even going to show up in the graph. So we don't have to worry about them. So my only x-intercepts are two and negative ten thirds. Okay, two and negative ten thirds. Negative ten thirds. Three goes into ten three times with one left over, so it's three and a third. One, two, three and a third. There's negative ten thirds right there. Okay. Here at 2, since the, multiplicity is, since the multiplicity is odd, it's going to cross. Here at negative 10 thirds, since the multiplicity is even, it's going to touch but not cross. Okay, So let's figure out what the end behavior is like. If I imagine multiplying this out, from this group I'm going to get an x cubed, right? When I go to cube this thing. When I go to square this thing, I'm going to get a 9x squared, right? Like imagine writing 3x plus 10 times 3x plus 10, you're going to get a 9x squared. So from this group, I'm going to get a 9x squared. And then from this group, there's nothing to multiply out. I just have an x cubed. So if I'm thinking about the leading term, it's going to be x cubed times 9x squared times x squared. So that's going to be 9x to the 7th.
Okay, so we have an even. Uh, we have a sorry. We have a positive coefficient and an odd exponent. So that's going to look like your standard cubic. Going to look something like that. <clears throat> okay. So I know that uh, here at negative ten thirds, I'm just going to be touching. I'm just going to be touching. And then after I touch, it's just going to continue to go down forever. Whereas here, at positive 2, I know that I'm going to be crossing. But after I cross, it's going to continue to go up forever. So what happens in between? Well, obviously, you must have something like that happening. Okay? And so that's what that function looks like, more or less. Probably it's a, it's much steeper than that. Like, I, I would bet it probably looks maybe something more like this, right? So maybe it does something more like this. Okay, but this is a good enough this is a good enough picture uh, for the purposes of a pre-calculus class. Okay, um, let's do another one. Okay, this is a good one, right? This is a good one. So this one hasn't been factored for us. So we actually have to do a little bit of work in order to figure out what the zeros are before we can even try to graph this. Um, finding the end behavior is going to be easier, though, because we can see really clearly that the end behavior is going to be negative 2x cubed. So it's going to be a negative cubic, right? It's going to go like this and then like this. So we can see that uh, automatically. But let's find the zeros. Uh, factoring by grouping, not going to work here. So I think I have to use rational zeros theorem. And they're going to be plus or minus uh, factors of 30 over factors of 2. So factors of 30 are going to be 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 10, 15, and 30. And then factors of 2 are going to be 1 and 2. Uh, so, you know, 1, 1 half, 2, 3, 3 halves, 5, 5 halves, 6, 10, 15, 15 halves, and 30, right? So those are all the possibilities. I'm not going to write them out, but um, let's start testing. I only need to find 1. If I can find 1, this will turn into a quadratic, and then I'll be able to either factor or use quadratic formula to do the rest. Let's test 1. Negative 2. 7, 7, and negative 30. Okay, so 1 doesn't work. Let's try 2. Okay, so 2 doesn't work. Uh, let's try 3. Ooh, this is going to be big. This is going to be positive. So I found my upper bound. 3 is not a 0. But I know that no positive number bigger than 3 is going to be 0. So I don't even need to test 5, 6, 10, 15, or 30. Uh, I already know that they're not going to work. So let's try with the negatives. Let's go to negative 1. So we have negative 2, 2, 9, negative 9, negative 2, 2, and then, you know, negative 28 or whatever. So that's not going to work. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to circle this, though, so I remember this is my upper bound. Maybe I'll call it UB for upper bound. Uh, negative 1 doesn't work. Let's try negative 2. Two, negative 4, 3, negative 6. This isn't going to work. Negative uh, 
Oh, hold on a second. Hold on a second. It should have been a negative 2. That changes everything, right? Negative 2, positive 4. 9, 10, 11, positive 11, negative 22. Negative 22 plus 7 is negative 15. Oh, that would have been a disaster if I hadn't caught that mistake, right? Because there's our 0. Right? Negative 2 is a 0. Okay, good. So now we can say f of x is x plus 2 times negative 2x squared plus 11x plus 15. Can I factor that any further? I kind of feel like I can. Uh, 15 and 1. No, 15 and 1 won't work. I could try third. I could try 3 and 5. 9 and 5 won't work. Wait, wait, wait. 6 and, Oh, yeah, 3 and 5. Okay, I think I got it. Thinking x plus 2. You know, it would be easier if I pulled out the negative. Let me pull out the negative real quick. 2x squared minus 11x minus 15. Uh, so then I have negative x plus 2. 2x and x. And then it's got to be a 5 and a 3. What did I decide? I think 3 and 5. Would, that's going to give me a 6 and a 5, which I think has a chance of giving me 11. Oh, but no, because this sign is negative, so one of these has to be positive, the other negative, so this isn't going to work. Ooh, maybe it doesn't factor. You know, maybe it doesn't factor. Let me just use quadratic formula to see. I'm going to say x is negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c. Uh, that's 4 times 30. So, uh, so plus, because of that negative sign, so plus uh, 120 divided by 2 times a is 4. Uh, 121 plus 120 is not a perfect square. So this would not have been factorable. Okay. It was almost deceptively factorable, but it's not factorable. Okay, so this is going to be uh, 11 plus or minus square root 241, 241 divided by 4. Uh, square root 241 is not even reducible. Yeah, it's just the square root of 241. <clears throat> I'm wondering if... I've made a mistake. Let me, so bear with me while I check my work here for a second. Um, I mean, I think this looks good. This looks good. Took out the negative. Those do, both became negative. So, yeah, can't factor. I've got uh, negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4 times <coughs> um, a times c is 241. Yep, okay, that's as good as it's going to get. So there are my other zeros. <clears throat> I wonder about how much these are, because they're going to be x-intercepts, right? So I need to have some idea where they fall on the x-axis. 11 plus root 241 divided by 4 is approximately 6.6 <clears throat> 11 minus root 241 divided by 4 is approximately negative 1.1. And those are both multiplicity 1. Okay, so my zeros are negative 2, 6.6, .6, and negative 1.1, all with multiplicity 1. Okay, so let's plot those. Negative uh, 1.1 is about there. Negative 2 is really close to it, right about there. And then 6.6. 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6.6, 6, right about there. They all have multiplicity 1, so the graph is going to cross through in each of these locations. And <clears throat> the end behavior, we said, because our leading term is a negative 2x cubed, 
we know that the end behavior is going to look like this, right? It's going to look like a negative cubic. So, <clears throat> and it's crossing in each location. So it's going to cross, and then cross, and then cross. It's got to look something like that. I'm curious to know what this one looks like in Desmos. <laughs> Let's take a look. <clears throat> So we've got negative 2x cubed uh, plus 7x squared plus 7x minus 30. Okay, so here we go. Oh, what in the world? What did I do wrong? I have a sign wrong somewhere. I have a sign wrong. This is 2.5 and 3. What? Negative 2. What? Hmm. I have led you very far astray somewhere. Let me see. What in the world did I do wrong? Hmm. Negative 2, they're saying, is a 0. Did I do this division wrong? Negative 2, 4, 11, negative 22, negative 15, and 30. So you get negative 2x squared plus 11x uh, minus 15. Minus 15. Oh, can you believe it? So it was factorable. It was factorable. Forget this. It was factorable. Uh, Good thing we checked this one. So plus 15, so it should be a minus 5 and a minus 3. And then you get the positive 15, you get the negative 6, and the negative 5 gives you negative 11. And so none of this is any good. We get, uh, oh, negative 2 is a 0. But then we get 3 is a 0. And then we get 5 halves. That's where they're getting the 2.5. Holy schmoly, you guys. Oh, wow. I led us astray. I, I apologize. So um, so this is wrong. I'm going to draw a new graph down here. What we should actually have is negative 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, and 5 halves, which is 2 and a half, 1, 2 and a half, right there. Okay, but the end behavior is still going like this and like this, and it's still crossing in each of those locations. <laughs> so it looks something like that. And I think that's what Desmos is showing us. Yes, if we zoom out enough. Right, it's looking exactly like what we what we graphed. Oh man. Okay. Sorry about that. All of this work with the nasty quadratic formula and it was factorable all along. Anyway, if you were sitting there yelling at the computer screen the whole time, I apologize. Uh but hey, at least I caught it, right? <laughs> okay. So there's that one. You know, we're all human, right? We all make mistakes. There we go. Um, <clears throat> okay. So that's all I want to say about graphing polynomial functions. I, I think that graphing polynomial fun functions is pretty straightforward once you know how to find the zeros of polynomials. And once you understand what uh, multiplicities do to graphs and what the end behavior of a graph is, then, um, then graphing polynomial functions is really a piece of cake. So that's all. Th those are all the examples I'm going to give of that. But what I do want to do is uh, do what I said I was going to do at the end of the last section, which was to show you one one technique for approximating the zeros of a polynomial if we are not able to find what they are exactly. Okay. So at this point, we've developed most of the known tools for finding the exact values of the zeros of a polynomial. We can find any rational zeros. Under certain conditions, we can find we can even find irrational and complex zeros. However, we aren't guaranteed that we can always find the irrational or complex zeros. So what do we do if we know a polynomial has more zeros, but we don't have the tools to find their exact values? Well, looking at the graph of the function can sometimes give us a clue. For example, suppose that for some function f of x, we know that f of 2 is 5 and f of 3 is negative 2. So f of 2 is 5, and f of 3 
is negative 2. Okay. Since polynomials are, are smooth functions with no holes, no jumps, no asymptotes, nothing like that, we know that these two points must be connected by a smooth curve. Some other stuff is going to happen, of course, but they're connected by a smooth curve, which means the curve has to cross the x-axis at some point between 2 and 3. In other words, there has to be a 0 somewhere in between 2 and 3. Okay? More generally, we can say this. Let's say that a and b are real numbers, and that f is a polynomial function, such that f of a and f of b have different signs. Okay? If that's the case, then there's at least one real zero between a and b. This is called the intermediate value theorem. It's a big deal in calculus, okay? Um, so you'll talk about it a lot in calculus, but um, for the purposes of our class, this is an important thing, right? So if f is a polynomial and f of a and f of b have different signs, then there's at least one real zero between a and b. <clears throat> Okay. We can use the intermediate value theorem to get an approximation. And in fact, we can make our approximation as accurate as we like. Let me show you how this works. So first of all, let's show that this function has a real zero between 1 and 2. And then let's approximate that zero to the nearest tenth. Right? So to the nearest tenth. Well, first of all, to show that this function has a real zero between 1 and 2, all we have to do is show that f of 1 and f of 2 are different signs, right? So let's see. f of 1 is 2 times 1 cubed minus 3 times 1 minus 6. That's 2 minus 3 minus 6, which is, uh, what, negative 7? Okay. Uh, f of 2 is 2 times 2 cubed minus 3 times 2 minus 6. That's going to be 2 cubed is 8, and 8 times 2 is 16. So this is 16 minus 6 minus 6, and that's uh, 4. Okay, well, since f of 1 is positive and f of 2, or sorry, since f of 1 is negative and f of 2 is positive, there must be a 0 between 1 and 2. So by the intermediate value theorem, since f of 1 is negative and f of 2 is positive, uh, f of x has to equal 0 somewhere between 1 and 2. Okay, that's good. Well, let's approximate it to the nearest tenth. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find f of 1.5 right in the middle. And um, based on whether that's positive or negative, then I'll know whether the 0 is somewhere between 1, 1 and 1 1.5 or between 1.5 and 2, right? So let's find f of 1.5. This is going to be uh, 2 times 1.5 cubed minus 3 times 1.5 minus 6. I'm just going to use my calculator. 2 times 1.5 cubed minus 3 times 1.5 minus 6 is negative 3.75. Okay, so f of x is negative at 1, and it's still negative at 1.5. So between 1 and 1.5, it has not changed sign. And that means it hasn't crossed the x-axis between those two points. So the 0 must come somewhere between 1.5 and 2, where at 1.5 the function is negative, but at 2 the function is positive. So it must cross the x-axis at some point between 1.5 and 2. So let me, let me, um, let me try uh, 1.7. We'll try 1.7. Let's see. So 2 times 1.7 cubed minus 3 times 1.7 minus 6 is, oh, hold on, 1.7 cubed. This is still negative. 
into negative 1.274. So the zero must happen somewhere between 1.7 and 2. So maybe I'll try 1.8. So I'm going to go back to my calculator, replace the 1.7s with 1.8s. And there we go, I get 0 0.264. Okay, so the 0 happens somewhere between 1.7 and 1.8. Do you see that? Because at 1.7 the function is negative, but at 1.8 the function is positive. So the 0 must happen somewhere between 1.7 and 1.8. Uh, now, if I want to round this to the nearest decimal place, to, to, to one decimal place, then I actually need to know if the zero is closer to 1.8 or 1.7. And so um, I'm going to plug in something like f of 1.75 to see if it's positive or negative here. So let's see. 1.75 cubed minus 3 times 1.75 minus 6 is negative 0 0.53125. Okay, so um, so the the function changes sign between 1.75 and 1.8. That means that the zero must take place somewhere between 1.75 and 1.8. So if I round that zero to one decimal place, it would have to be 1.8, right? So the zero is approximately 1.8. You'll notice though, that if I wanted to be accurate to two decimal places, that I could continue this process. I could continue to say, okay, so the zero happens somewhere between 1.75 and 1.8. What about 1.77, right? Um, you know, and I could, I could keep guessing um, until I find out where the thing is changing sign more precisely. And and theoretically, we could be accurate to 10 decimal places, or to 20 decimal places, or to 50 decimal places. And you could imagine writing a computer program, for example that will give you an approximation to you know hundreds of decimal places if you wanted to and it could probably run that run that um, uh, algorithm you know in the blink of an eye so this is this is what we do right and this is what computers do if, if they if they can't find the exact zeros using any of the algebraic techniques that we talked about well then they just approximate them by doing something like this there are more uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Efficient. That's the word I'm looking for. There are more efficient algorithms than this, right? So, so other algorithms are better. They'll get you the, the approximation a little bit quicker. Um, you might learn about some of them in calculus. Like there's this thing called Newton's method, which is a little bit quicker than just using the intermediate value theorem. But anyway, um, there you go, right? That's how you can approximate a zero, a real zero, if you don't, um, if you, if you're not able to find its exact value. Okay, um, and that's all I want to say about that.